Welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV. We're okay. here in the uh, law offices of right. Sheldon Kirshner, right. who has another life as a horn player right. and as a psychologist. Yes. And uh, a uh, certainly uh, somebody uh, who worked with Mr. Jacobs um, fairly closely. Yeah. Uh, various points. Uh, I had a lesson <laughs> every other week forever until he passed. And half of the lesson was talking. I mean, about personal matters, family stuff, mm -hmm. business stuff, whatever, you know. And then, you know, we played. I played. And I had, uh, I had some, I'm a horn player, but I had some tuba lessons. I had some singing. Uh, I had my horn. Yeah. And, uh, well, I'm sure it was a, it was a, a an hour that Mr. Jacobs looked forward to. Oh, well, that's very yeah. nice. Uh, we, we were, we we're good friends, and uh, sometimes you just call up and say, uh, what are you doing at 4 o'clock? Uh, uh, nothing, I, but I didn't practice. Oh, uh, come, just come over, just come over, you know? And then that usually 4 o'clock, sometimes 5 was his last lesson, usually 4. But by then, he was already running a little late, but he would just run it. And the only two times that I was late in 30, 20, 30 years, those two times, he was on time. <laughs> and he said, where are you? <laughs> where were you, you know? So, what, uh, it, during those that 30 years, did you notice a, a difference in his teaching style, or his pedagogy, or his focus, or? No, uh, I really didn't. Uh, you came into his uh, his studio. I didn't study at the house. I studied, although I'd been in the house, mm -hmm. you know, and then the basement, same as the basement. Uh, you were in a welcome place, mm -hmm. and that never changed. And uh, he tried to make you comfortable. Mm-hmm. Not uh, people from what he said often uh, became very frustrated during the lesson because they they would prepare all kinds of things and he you would play three measures or something like that he would stop you and he would say I really don't understand why people get so upset he said if you could play everything wonderfully what why what would you be doing here mm -hmm. my job is to help solve problems so as soon as i see something that i think we should address then we do it so you're saying it's people some people would be uh frustrated because they didn't get through the whole concerto they would jake would just really focus on getting at least one thing to sound great well or one he would solve a problem that you mm -hmm. have whether you thought you had it or not if he thought there was something that was amiss in your playing, your breathing, the way you attack things, whatever, he, he would improve it for you. And in master classes, he could achieve amazing things with people. Right, yeah. And uh, there was a gal who was uh, a bone player, and she went through all kinds of physical manipulations with her face and everything to play in a, a bass tessitura, real bass tessitura. And, uh, and he sort of practiced her on playing down there without going through all that stuff. And so she was playing this thing and he just said to her, now, or something like that. And instinctively she just, boom! Put down the trombone, she said, oh my God. <laughs> it was, it, yeah, it was there all the time, you know. And do you think, do you think that uh, his knowledge of psychology, you know, he was, he was a student of his students. Uh, well, do you think he had, that had, he, he was waiting for that opportunity to more or less get through the back door, or surprise her when she would be least expecting? I didn't think he planned anything. Uh, too much. First of all, 
Uh, and, and I was thinking what I would say if the question came up. Uh, Arnold Jacobs, Jake, Mr. Jacobs, he was a very smart, very intelligent man. Uh, he was not uh, the great artiste who uh, was never a student. Oh, no, 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 no. He was a smart guy. He intended to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, things didn't, I don't know whether they didn't work out exactly or whatever, but uh, he had great intelligence. Right. And yeah. he was very well aware of it. And, uh, but he never, it, it is a key to his teaching. He never had to impress you with anything. Mm -hmm. He, sometimes teachers, uh, have a bad habit. They have to show the student how wonderful they are, how much better they are than the student. Never did that stuff. No, 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 no. His job was to help you. And if you didn't get it, you didn't belong there. He always felt that you would learn better if he was encouraging in every way. There's a famous statement, I think, by Emerson. Emerson said, what you are thunders so loudly, I cannot hear what you have to say. Well, he, he wanted to bring out the best. Mm -hmm. He wanted to encourage you, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so he did. And, and that's how he, he got the most from people. He wanted you to be relaxed, but focused. Relax. He he didn't want stressors on top of you. He wanted you, and he t he taught you how to deal with stressors. Uh, one time I had a lesson, and I thought to myself, "Do I really sound as bad as I think I do?" And he said to me, "You know," he said, "Today he said you sound like shit." He said, "So." Let's have a lesson on what to do when you sound like shit. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's that's what it's uh, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Is how to make sure you sound the best you can. Yeah, how to get past those bad days. Yeah, those bad days, those bad moments. And uh, one time, Dale played something, Clevenger, and there was a crack in it or something, and he went on like nothing had happened. And I asked him afterwards. Didn't that bother you? You know, your focus? He said, it's gone. He said, you can't go back. He said, the next instant is what you're playing for. He said, mm -hmm. you ask Jake if that isn't right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the way it is. Sheldon, can you, can you uh, uh, expand upon the, just what, how, what use of psychology Jake might or might not have brought into his teaching? Uh, Jake uh, was a very practical psychologist. Uh, that is to say, he had an understanding of psychological principles which he used in a very uh, practical way. He applied things. He knew what he was doing. He was uh, very keen about what we might call stimulus change. In other words, uh, he would change the stimulus complex to make it easier for you to change the habits that were involved with a similar stimulus uh, complex. So you're talking about strangeness? Yes, strangeness. Okay. Strangeness. And uh, that is the translation of his understanding of psychological principles and uh, conditioning. Uh, when you practiced to make you uh, more aware of the kind of focus that you needed to have to perform. It's one thing to play, you know, in the bathroom for yourself or your friend, you know, the 
down from your grandmother. But you know <laughs> what I mean. Not through your grandmother. Puddles, cover your ears. Cover your ears. Yeah. He said, just imagine there's a mic in front of you. You're on. Yeah. Just imagine that uh, Schulte is walking by outside your rehearsal room door. Whatever, and he knows who's in there. And however you play, that's how he's going to remember you. Mm -hmm. Feel it and play through it. Mm -hmm. Get used to it. Prepare yourself. Uh, Dale talks about uh, practicing alert. Don't just vibrate. Don't just do stuff casually. Play alert. Alert to the music. Mm -hmm. In my, some of my lessons with Jacobs, uh, the first time I came across this concept was from him, and the, which is um, in order to develop and uh, change an old habit, you don't want to focus on the old habit. You don't want to try and change the old habit. You want to introduce a new change. habit. Yeah, do something new okay. in order to get around the... So what is the new thing? It's the mic. Right, yeah. It's the mic, and it's... It's Reiner outside your door. It's Schulte outside your door, hesitating for just a moment to listen. You better give him $50, not 50 cent notes, because that's going to make you or break you. There's the job right out there. Mm -hmm. Better not miss. And that's why it, it occurred to me when you were talking about that uh, the trombonist, the female trombonist in the master class, where Jake did something yes. just surprising. That's right. That it was, maybe it was that, that sense of strangeness that he was trying to uh, surprise her with that. Uh, right. What he was trying to do was, uh, that's exactly right, was uh, break her out of her preparation and let the teaching that he had just provided and the experience he had just provided uh, come forth and let everything else get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way. Yeah, to be able to succeed. Right. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. the strangeness is the way he did it. And that's the stimulus change, newness, strangeness. Mm -hmm. uh, and he understood the concept very well. He, he didn't talk about it too much. Uh, he found that pointless. But he always said, it's a simplification. Just get to where you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, analysis by paral paralysis by analysis. And now there is co and, and cognitive psychology and all this stuff. The point is, it does not help us to overanalyze. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. He said you have to have the mature musical mind of an experienced player and the physical facility of a six-year-old. In other words, mm -hmm. just do it. Get out of the way. And he sang out how he wanted the last boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And he said, now imitate my voice. And I, 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 uh, I was careless about it. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, that's not how my voice is. I said, just a minute, I remember how your voice was. And I emulated his voice exactly. He said, that's right. So using imitation as a as a teaching tool. Huge teaching tool. Yeah. Huge teaching tool. He always played for you on the mouthpiece, and if you were a tubist, he would play it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but he always, and that's one thing Wedgwood always did is he always played it for you, so you could hear it. Clevenger, he plays it for you. He wants you to have a model. And Clevenger used to say some, you know, sometimes. Students complain they want to play it their way. Mm -hmm. And he would tell them, first, play it my way, and at least you'll have something that everybody will accept. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to do something else, that's another thing. Right. But <clears throat> you'll learn more by imitation because you really cannot teach anybody. There, there are people who, who disagree and there are some techniques for high notes and so forth and so on. But generally speaking, <coughs> you cannot, you cannot, uh, you have no uh, brain cells in your uh, embouchure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you call for products. And uh, as your uh, system has evolved, 
uh, when you have enough experience, uh, you know, practice experience, then when you call for these uh, products, they're delivered. You know, he used to throw a pencil at people. Yeah. And they would grab it. And he said, did you tell your fingers what to do? No, of course not. You knew what to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's automatic. <coughs> Over yeah. here, and not only that, you could do it anywhere here, right? <coughs> because these are big bands, yeah. So, and he used to say, too, if somebody can play something and get the proper product, don't fool with their embouchure, right? For that, and there are many uh, brass players <coughs> who have had, so I understand unfortunate experiences with famous people or renowned people who who changed their embouchures without understanding what it is. Mm -hmm. One half, one half, two thirds, one third. Mm -hmm. He said, it's, can they do it with what they have? And if they can, don't, don't fool with it. Don't change it. Don't change something that works well. Right, yeah. Well, and I remember the Jacobs would sometimes refer to the Farkas book that has all the CSO brass player embouchures, and, you know, they all, maybe one or two of them look correct, Yeah. Um, right. but not necessarily all of them, and yet all of them were accomplished players. Right. And, so, and I asked him about that once. He said, uh, they play well, in spite of having uh, non-efficient, uh, no, we're not talking about that. They, they made themselves uh, to be able to do something and so it really worked. But they had inefficiencies in breathing and this and that and the other, and I asked them how they were able to do it. He said, their talent carries them through in spite of not uh, working with their best efficiencies and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, tight guts! Right. And, uh, <coughs> And this kind of uh, thing, they did it uh, in spite of all of that. Right. Yeah, I've heard him say that. Sheldon, do you do you, do you have any uh, uh, memories of uh, things that Jake might have shared with you about his experiences at University of Chicago Medical School or Northwestern Medical School? Well, he uh, he worked with a pulmonologist there, a woman, who was on the medical faculty, who uh, I'm pretty sure was an MD. And uh, he worked ab uh, with her about uh, lung volumes, and uh, there is a decrease in lung volume with age. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't use your full lung volume anyhow, and so the greater the lung volume you're able to, you know, the, the greater the amount of air relative to your lung, lung volume, the, uh, the, the longer the, the, longer the uh, effective line the that you have. And of course, never, uh, never uh, compromise tone production for line. Yeah, I remember him saying, always protect the ends of your phrases. Right, yeah. don't die. Yeah. Don't die, don't sound horrible. Find another place for a little air. He could breathe faster than anybody I ever met. Full Frog to tip mm -hmm. in an instant. Yeah, he amazing. worked on that. He worked on that. Uh, he uh, he could go from as low as he cared to be to full in. Yeah, and that's what it sounded like. And it was a yawn, <coughs> but he was pulling it in in the yawn. Right, it was a very active yawn. And uh, he could keep that. Uh, he could keep that sound going. Uh, people say, "Well, did he have one lung?" No, he didn't have one lung. He had two lungs. He never lost a lung or anything. But he told me that, to the best of my recollection, and, and I don't think I'm wrong, he never had more than four, maybe. four four and a half liters. Yeah, I think I heard him say four and, and he, a half at the max. Yeah, that very, very max. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as little as 
two and a half or two and three quarters uh, when he was, uh, you know, the tubist. Uh, before he lost weight, he lost a lot of weight, mm -hmm. and he got back uh, some by him. So he was a, he was in the threes, yeah, uh, with the uh, big weight loss and everything. But uh, he could make it work uh, because of great efficiencies in breathing. Yeah, uh, and uh, he, as I say, could he could pull full lung volume as much as he could in in the shortest time. And it would not be disruptive. No, you hardly knew. Sometimes you never knew. Depending. Right. If you were next to him, you certainly knew. However, it wasn't disruptive to his playing. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me he worked very hard at his tone production, uh, developing it. And uh, did he ever talk about Donatelli? His teacher Curtis, in terms of the tone production, I, I I know that he learned to break the rules from Donatelli, but yeah, uh, no, I, I didn't. Uh, he really didn't. Uh, you know, uh, Brian uh, probably would know more about that than uh, than I do. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize <coughs> about uh, Jake's teaching. What was that he was, if I haven't done it enough, he was a problem solver. And um, he would do everything he could to encourage the best out of you. Mm -hmm. Not just by being uh, friendly, but by doing whatever it was that he, he thought would improve the likelihood of your solving certain problems whether you knew you had them or you didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was that you didn't take an affair. Some teachers are hard on students. He never thought uh, that was a good idea. Uh, when you went to him, he taught simplification. Mm -hmm. He taught the essence of uh, making the right kind of sounds, having the right kind of thoughts in your head. He told me, <clears throat> he took on a challenge once. He had a neighbor who uh, was tone deaf. That is to say, couldn't carry a tune. Mm -hmm. And uh, he taught him trombone well enough so that he actually could play in a professional orchestra. Wow. That's great. Uh, yeah, I remember Jake was definitely about peeling back the layers of complexity until you could be successful, and then slowly adding one layer back. Yes, that was always that was a great. He, he said, and he said, uh, uh, crudities can be refined. Mm -hmm. Silence cannot be. That's right. <laughs> So if it, even if it's a bad sound, at least it's a sound. That's right. You, you can, can work, you work with it. You, yeah. can work, you can't work with silence. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't have <coughs> a sound in your head, then uh, it's a bad start. You, you need to have something. Mm -hmm. You need to have a model, why it's, which is why it's always good. Uh, and... Uh, uh, he always uh, believed in a couple of uh, practical things. He said, take your very best sound and move it around. And whatever your best sound is, bring it in all the various ranges, mm -hmm. of the high tessitura, low tessitura. Keep that very good sound there. He said, and that is the building of your basic uh, sound. A uh, very well respected younger tubist uh, put a challenge to him, uh, Jake, in his uh, older years about volume. And Jake said, You really think you can play louder than me? And he said, Well, you know, he said, uh, he said Come up to my studio. 
and he put a sound meter up. He said, we don't need tubas. We don't need horns. He said, let's just play on the mouthpiece. Let's see who has the greatest volume. Well, it wasn't Jake who left with his tail between his legs. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, look, it's so great for you to uh, allow us to come in and uh, My pleasure. talk about Jake and Puddles, who's uh, been admiring this uh, device. This is the original, uh, uh, not original, but one of the, uh, uh, I guess probably the last recording equipment piece in Jake's studio. Right. And I remember recording some of my lessons on this. Uh, oh, yes. On this device. This was for those in the know. You come in, put a cassette in there, mm -hmm. press the button, and off you went, and after two seconds, you forgot it was going. Yep, you did. <coughs> I have two shopping bags full of them. <laughs> of cassette tapes? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, Puddles would uh, like to uh, have me present you as a, a token of our thanks. Uh, these uh, Thank genuine you. University of Oregon premium duck malted balls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and... Uh, once I came and I didn't have my mouthpiece. And he said, I've got the mouthpieces in the drawer, the top uh -huh. drawer. He said, uh, take one out. Let me see which one you take. So I, I did. And he said, yeah, I like that one. He said, next lesson, bring one for the box. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and now All back right. to you. All right.